Moving on, our next speaker for today, we have Mr. Benny Buston, Director of DevOps from Attend T. Benny is on a mission to improve Attend T delivery speed by leveraging the power of automation. Working in the software industry for more than 20 years, Benny has gained vast experience in legacy deployment strategy and new technologies. Having moved from a senior DevOps role at a global network provider, at and for past nine years, Benny is now leading the DevSecOps transformation at Attenti. As the DevOps SME within the organization, Benny has boosted software delivery by continually improving the CI-CD processes as well as continuous security. He has accomplished all of the above by utilizing recent tech and open source technologies all with great passion and a big smile. His session for today is Dev COVID Ops, Two Sprints to Production. Hi, everybody. How are you? Uh, I want to start with something that uh, looked like a date, but uh, it's not actually date. It's actually uh, the number of uh, hours and days, which is 13 hours for three days that it took us to put into production our new quarantine management system. And there were challenges, okay? And you in this talk, I'm going to explain to you how, uh, how attentive joined the worldwide effort to fight COVID-19 virus and the challenges we had to build a new quarantine management system. And most important is how using the right DevOps and security practices on our daily basis help us to deliver a new product to the market in just two sprints. Um, I want to start with something funny, okay, <laughs> that I saw during uh, the first lockdown of COVID-19 in Spain. So since uh, it wasn't allowed to go outside uh, to buy food or, 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 you know, except for buying food or going to the um, to medical equipment, um, I found this post in Facebook so for a woman that she actually rent her dog for walk, so people can go actually out of the house, not just to buy food, but also just to go to the park or something. And uh, as you can see, she's like, uh, send it for one uh, trip with uh, 1.5 euro, five trips for six euros. And the reason I'm showing you is because I think COVID-19, uh, and now that we're almost already like a year and a half with COVID, put us in a new normal, and it sharp our innovative ideas, okay? And it's also something we did here in Attempt. A little bit about myself. Um, I led uh, various roles during my career, uh, from support uh, roles to integration, architecture, and DevOps. Uh, I actually uh, started my current role in Attempt during the COVID-19 lockdown um, last year. It was the first day I had was actually starting from home. And um, some, some guy told me uh, a few, few uh, weeks ago that uh, Atenti and at and sound the same. Okay, they both have a lot of A and Ts, but they're completely different uh, companies. And I also had a dog. Okay, so I was able to go outside during the lockdown, taking to trip, going to a park. So it was... Uh, Nice for me and for my kids. Um, 30 seconds about Atenti. So Atenti is a global leader in the field of electronic monitoring. Uh, we are developing and manufacture different type of solution for monitoring subject, such as uh, you know, crimi criminal in home curfew, offender of domestic violence and more. And we were actually one of the first uh, IoT companies uh, the company is like 26 years old. So I want to take you back to the beginning of uh, February last year. 
okay? Um, we saw more and more um, COVID-19 cases increases uh, in the news. And we thought at Attenti how our portfolio of product can help governments and health organization across the world um, for people who actually uh, had to be in a home curfew because they uh, just uh, land uh, from uh, red countries or, or they need to be in a, a home curfew because of uh, or home quarantine because of uh, uh, the thing that they just returned uh, from abroad. And uh, while some of our customers, okay, use the, let's say, the more traditional electronic monitoring devices and just put a, an electronic uh, a handcuff on, on people who just need to be in uh, quarantine. Uh, we want to provide something which uh, is a, li a lighter solution, okay, that can be installed on every person's mobile phone and it's not going to be too much intrusive. Um, and lucky us, we didn't have uh, an offering that we built for the US market. It wasn't 100% fit for this, but in this talk, you'll learn about uh, what it is and how we did it. So the, our product team together with R&D, um, you know, started to think, okay, what do we need? Okay, what are the features that we uh, need to add uh, into a quarantine management system? So we want, we want to have uh, ability that everybody using this app uh, will uh, do like an online check-in, which means that it's going to check that he's not uh, leaving the house. And every few hours or one hour, they're going to do some uh, biometric identification. Okay, they need to actually look at the camera, doing some famous recognition, voice recognition. And uh, the way that a way for um, health organization communicate with the subject, that are in the home uh, quarantine and um, sending some medical information and so on. And in the other side on the management app, we need to build a, a web application to uh, monitor all those patients that they are in uh, quarantine. So the product set will lay out a, a new UI, a new product and um, the marketing uh, team started to go and, 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 and show this uh, idea to different governments. And governments started to get a lot of interest in this product. And we got the first uh, production installation plan for the uh, beginning of uh, April 2020. OK. Um, so what we did, we actually decided to, to pause okay, some of our development of, uh, on the current development that we had. And we took uh, two scrum teams for this task. And we knew that we have only like two weeks to production. Okay, it was like uh, in beginning of March, we knew that we have uh, two sprints uh, to make it work. And, you know, customers, as you go to customer and tell them, okay, I'm going to deliver a new product. They come in with a lot of requirements, okay? So some of the requirements was about security, okay? Since we are talking about medical information, um, medical records, then it's mean that uh, you need to make sure that all data is encrypted and, and all data is uh, uh, encrypted in transit at rest. Um, now, some of our customers want us to deploy this system in AWS, some in Azure, some want to be on-premise deployment. So we got different uh, requirements and we need to comply with those. Um, so what actually was missing in our application and what we had to develop in, in, uh, in two weeks, in two sprints. Um, so our application actually built from, on microservices, we're using Kubernetes and Dockers and so on. And, um, what we have to do, okay, we have to develop uh, in, a new web application, uh, for the, um, health organization. We have to integrate the web application gateways to enable security uh, on the, from the mobile, uh, from the public internet to the mobile. We had to build a, a new uh, a public Docker registry so all of our customers around the world can go and, and pull those microservices. And um, 
And of course, the new UI for the mobile application that we already have some of the features, but not all of them. Um, so we know what is missing uh, or what was part of missing. Um, and now I want to talk about some of um, the major decisions that we took that actually um, help us to build it and deliver it into sprints. So the first thing that we took, the, the first decision that we took was, um, was two years ago uh, is to use open, for, open source first. Okay, we want to reduce our costs. And we said that, okay, we need to use open source um, uh, as much as we can, okay? And in order to use it, okay, we have to uh, develop um, some security guidelines around it, which we're going to look at it again in a second. The second thing was we wanted to make sure our product is cloud agnostic. Now, I know that a lot of people are going into cloud native and they want to be uh, using uh, um, uh, only AWS services or only Azure or only Google Cloud. But we know that uh, our customers, some can be on-premise, some can be in different clouds, some can be on private clouds. Uh, and this is the second decision. Now, when we're talking about open source, um, open source bring with him a lot of challenges, okay? Um, so the first thing is that we, uh, we build uh, uh, our pipeline, okay? With all the quality gates, to make sure that our code open source are, um, doesn't have any vulnerabilities, doesn't have any uh, security limit, um, licenses limitation. Um, and we, uh, we actually uh, put um, uh, um, open source scanning tools in our pipeline. The second thing is was to uh, look at our open source infrastructure like Kubernetes, uh, Kafka, and so on, and make sure that we are using the right security guidelines or and, and build it correctly, okay? Like uh, not using root in a Docker container and other security measures. Um, the second thing is, like I told you, we want to, get, to be uh, cloud agnostic. And in order to be cloud agnostic, um, we want to make sure that we have a, what we call flexible deployment stack. Now, flexible deployment stack is basically uh, is about um, building your infrastructure on layers. So the first layer that we used was that we build Terraform, Terraform recipes, basically uh, build the infrastructure. So it doesn't matter if you bring me a, a VMware ES6i or a Azure a virtual machine or AWS EC2. Uh, we know how to build this infrastructure. We use a common tool to build the infrastructure to build the, the VM. The second thing that we did was to use uh, Ansible. Okay, Ansible as our uh, configuration management. Uh, we didn't use uh, um, a Kubernetes distribution platform. We, I know that uh, you know in the cloud, people are using AKS in Azure, EKS in Amazon, which are great, okay? But when you have to be cloud agnostic, um, you have to bring your own distribution. Now, we didn't go with uh, OpenShift or Rancher or other distributions because um, those actually cost money, okay? And you want to, to put to make sure that our product costs less. And the second thing is that um, it wasn't mature enough, okay, for us um, or for our customers. And some customer doesn't want to put uh, a rancher or maybe have some their own uh, requirement. Maybe they will say, okay, I want to have a, a different distribution of Kubernetes. So we go with plain vanilla Kubernetes, and believe it or not, we're using KubeADM to install it. Um, and the platform on the platform itself. And of course, when we're working with it, this tier uh, um, structure, if a customer will come and say, okay, I want to replace the Kubernetes with uh, a different Kubernetes, we need just to replace the platform uh, uh, box. 
On top of the platform, after we installed the in Kubernetes, was to install other services like MongoDB, Kafka, Elasticsearch, um, Prometheus, Grafana, other tools that, or what we call the, the you know the main um, Kubernetes uh, so, um, the main services. We call them Kubernetes core services, but they are not actually Kubernetes. Uh, and this we use Helm. Okay, we're using Helm files to to install it, um, and we use also for our microservices. Um, now, I know that this is a tier uh, deployment, but again, we actually put everything in one uh, script, one Python script that actually uh, do this, build it, these layers, okay? So we have a Python script that actually build the different layers of the deployment. Um, for microservices, we're using Helm Chart and Jenkins. Uh, Jenkins trigger a job for a continuous deployment, which actually using Helm Chart. Um, and using this fl uh, flexible stack was a, was helping uh, it help us to use it for our main product, which was Aware, uh, which is the main product we are developing. Um, we were able to use. Uh, the same stack for our a check which is a us offering that we have now you have to understand that uh, while we have the core microservices that can be uh, the same for all our product we still have each product has its own uh, microservices and what we have to do is just take the whole stack and add some new microservices like we showed before like the web app the new web app application that we have to develop and that's why we actually able to um, simple use the same stack and build a new product. And of course, we have uh, what we call the operational playbooks that uh, can do other things on the cluster, uh, you know, such as uh, backup, uh, upgrade, infrastructure upgrades, and some other stuff as well. So, uh, so we cover what was missing. Okay, uh, you know, what we have to develop into Sprint. We cover the technology stack that we use and how it's actually help us. And now, okay, we are back in uh, Merge. We have two Sprints, so what are we doing? Okay, now the R&D team, uh, development team, uh, you know, um, started work on developing the web UI and the DevOps team started to do some other activities uh, in parallel. The first thing was about penetration tests. Now, since we develop a new web service, uh, which we had to expose uh, for customers uh, on their own deployment uh, uh, data centers or maybe on the shared one, we want to make sure that uh, it's meet an all standard, all security standard. Now, I know that doing penetration tests is a bit costly, okay? But when, in, when it came to DevSecOps, I'm a true believer in manual testing, okay? I know that you have SaaS and DAS tools that can cover most of the known uh, OSAP uh, top 10 security risk, but um, i rather to have an hacker trying to break my system than a tool, okay? Now, maybe in, in the future, maybe already now, there is some companies that are doing like a, uh, AI dust or AI dynamic security testing, part of the pipelines, but uh, I'm a true believer. So we had to, to engage a, a, a company, do a penetration test, fix some things that we found on the penetration test. The second thing <coughs> was that, you know, we're talking about thousands of people who are going to uh, land uh, uh, from red countries and they need to be in quarantine. Um, and we talked. We talked about uh, a high load of usage usage of this application, and uh, you know, um, running load load uh, um, is is always finding challenging things. And we did find some challenges. We had to to manipulate our Kafka queuing management system, and I can tell you, it was like a very long week of load testing, uh, like uh, sitting in a in the midnight and, and, and make sure that we're fixing things so we have enough time to run the load again during uh, uh, the night. 
Um, but we did it. We were able to, to, to load the system and get a product that can use in production. And the last thing is since each customer came with its own deployment requirement, and uh, at least the first customer wanted us to deploy the system in Azure, um, we wanted to use the, um, and the cloud tools for um, application gateway and, and, and WAF capabilities. Now, Azure has a, um, an uh, Azure API gateway that you can also add the uh, WAF capabilities. So we have to um, design the system in a way that uh, you can use uh, on the DMZ part of it, uh, the cloud service, and then using uh, private link going to uh, a VNet into uh, the Kubernetes clusters. And I can tell you that lucky us, okay, because uh, today using cloud services, it's, it's, it's very easy to use, it's very easy to implement, it's very easy to learn. And it took us, uh, I think like a day or two to build it, okay, to just uh, add WAF capabilities, add the API gateway, configure all the, a URL filtering rules and, and that was that was it. And most important, <laughs> I'm talking about merge time, okay? Um, while I know that a lot of companies emerged 2020, most of the companies already tell people, listen, go work from home. And also in the 20, uh, people actually develop this, everything from home, okay? Now, Everybody just, you know, start working from home. They need to work on a new product. They don't know how to work from home. It was very challenging. And we found ourselves on very, very different hours, working on different hours. Sometimes people had to be with the kids and sometimes we had to meet at uh, 10 a.m., 10, uh, 10 p.m., sorry, in the night. And um, it was very challenging. And, uh, you know, it's, um, I think it's, um, if you asked me uh, like um, a year ago, if um, if it's a if you can do it, if work from home can work, I would say I am not sure. But I think that the, the last year and also what we felt during the development of this uh, quarantine system is that it's work. Okay, it's work because it's basically it's about collaboration. Okay, and as as you have collaboration tool and you have the teams collaborate, then it doesn't matter where you're working from. So I'm backing to, I'm going back to the, what we started in the beginning. So we finished the development of the system. Um, the first day of the installation, was, the first customer was actually in, uh, in uh, Australia. So it was a uh, difficult hours for us and uh, because I'm, we are stated in Israel. And um, the first day was, um, by the beginning of April, and like I said, it took us three days and 13, 13 hours a day to, to build it, okay? And uh, to build it, uh, the system, and make it ready for uh, production. Now, we had challenges during the installation, okay? You know, some, not, nothing is going easily when you go into the first production installation, right? Um, we... We started installation, build the Kubernetes, build the infrastructure, the virtual machine. Uh, you know, after a long day of the first day, we thought, yes, we're going to, to finish in one day. But uh, then when we started the system, we saw that there were some uh, issues with the, the, the file system that was created for us. Okay, the virtual machine was created for us in this case. And we saw that there was some problem with the application gateway and the configuration. And we also found like a uh, last minute security, a uh, small issue that we want to fix. So it took us like three days, okay. Um, the second day was about fixing the virtual machine, uh, uh, file system layout, uh, closing all the um, networking around the application gateway and uh, um, Kubernetes cluster. But again, you know, we were so passionate about um, deploy because we understood the, the the impact of this kind of tool so we we did it and and it was like uh it was unbelievable okay everybody in the in the company was like amazed how it's possible that like two sprint ago 
you start a development and in two sprint we get into production at a customer site with a new product okay um and it, it was something that uh, i never experienced in my life okay and i think it's it's and we're going in the in the end about some takeaways and, and you will see the takeaways for me uh some small things about maybe about some of our um what i think is uh, our main reason for success uh in terms of devops is uh, our devops culture like you said during the talk um we're using a, a flexible stack and and we automate everything and it's very important for us not to do manual stuff we're putting a lot of effort on automation and we're putting a lot of effort in DevSecOps, okay, in our pipeline to make sure that uh, in our penetration test, in our security thinking. Um, the third thing is master the technology. Basically, you have to have people, you have to invest your people and to make sure that they, they are always continuous learning and uh, getting an expert on different type of tooling like uh, cloud, uh, like Kubernetes, like netbooking. Now, I have, you know, there is nothing, there is no one, or oh, let's say that it's very hard to find a full stack DevOps, okay? Somebody know everything. It's very important to investigate, invest time on our, your DevOps engineers on specific topics. Uh, because then they become a master in this, and then they able to provide you much more solutions. Um, and again, some takeaways um, from this is, uh, like I said, um, two sprints, it's a lot of time, okay? People sometimes think that, listen, ah, two sprint, it's not possible. I'm not sure if it's because we work from home uh, when we didn't have any uh, time uh, limits and, and we can just, you know, uh, uh, work in the morning, work at night. Maybe we work more hours than usually, but um, two sprints is a lot of time, okay? Especially when, we are, when you are passionate about, about deploying a new service. Um, Dev COVID ops. Dev COVID ops, it's, uh, it's actually, I, I take credit for this, okay? I think I'm the first one actually um, pronounce it, okay? And for me, Dev COVID ops means that, um, that basically it's, it's how COVID-19 uh, increase the adaptation of uh, DevOps transformation, okay? Um, and we saw how eventually DevOps is about collaboration. And when we move to work from home, you have to be much more collaborative. And this is what DevOps is all about. Um, and the last important thing, flexible deployment stack, uh, uh, basically build your application in tiered, uh, make sure that it, you can easily replace each part of it. You can easily use it for other products. Don't build something that work only with one product. And um, I don't know if you uh, you saw it, uh, and it was very popular in uh, in Facebook and other uh, social media. is um, is about um, there was a, about who led the digital transformation of your company. So I took it into who led the DevOps transformation of your company, and uh, you know although um, we already were kind of a DevOps company, but uh, I think COVID nineteen had a huge impact on our DevOps uh, transformation journey. And it proved us uh, once more that we are in the right path. And um, that's all. Thank you.